It's really great to be giving this talk uh, for two reasons. One, I just um, love to be able to give some talks on things I understand a little. Uh, second, uh, to be giving talk at Melbourne University, which is part of my, one of my alma maters. I did my, my other life, I was a biochemist and a microbiologist. And so I did my undergraduate at, um, at Otago University in New Zealand and my master's at, um, in, uh, at Melbourne University, University of Melbourne. Uh, in biochemistry and microbiology. So it's really exciting. And of course, after that, I moved to Montreal, to Canada, and uh, changed the field completely uh, to um, uh, cognitive and education psychology and branching up into more into cognitive science. So for two reasons, it's been great. And third, of course, it's lovely to be working with uh, Wendy Chapman and with Brian, and it's just great. So thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to, my talk today basically is going to be instead of, usually I tend to give a pure research talk uh, and I choose a topic of experimentation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a little bit more global talk about augmenting our own human capabilities and intelligence systems that support our abilities in healthcare and going to give uh, particular examples with summary of the data and then I'm going to give a lot of research information that uh, you can always look up because every study I'm going to talk about they are all published. I'm kind of stickler for publication. With that let me give you an oopsie let me just quickly click on this to make sure that I'm moving. Yeah all right so um, we talk a lot about cognition, the brain and cognition. So cognition is a part of the mind facility and the brain is mostly the neural part, the brain part. There's a neural cognitive function related to each other. The interesting thing is cognitive processes such as when all clinicians, all healthcare providers, all of us use, are you know problem solving reasoning we all perceive we are all reasonably intelligent in some form we have a creative we have memories we learn we um, acquire language to be able to see what kind of problem solving how do we do problem solving how do clinicians solve problems make decisions um, you know learn from it store information retrieve information how do you know about that? Well, you can't easily know because it's an invisible process. It's, it's a black box. You can't get to it. It's not so easy to do. So what you do is you try and find methods and theories that can be used to tease out how people, how doctors make decisions. Because if you don't know what their capabilities are and how they may do these things, then you definitely cannot develop systems that can support us. One of the sciences that are very important in, in un unpacking this black box is really called cognitive science. And the cognitive science is, is a, one of the fields that includes linguistics, philosophy, uh, neuroscience, computer science, cognitive psychology and cognitive anthropology. And these are the providers, the theory and methods. So you can use any one of those theories and methods to understand any clinical problem that you want or any problem as for that matter. And I was director of the Montreal Neurological, uh, Montreal Cognitive Science Center for a number of years. And very early in my, in sort of early nineties, and it was a very important field and now it's become even more important. And as the field is growing now in cognitive science, how does science inform clinical practice? And how does it inform development of systems, intelligence system, AI? So let's walk through that. So cognitive, these things that I call the black box, is like a, a what's underneath an iceberg. So if you look at iceberg, what is underneath is, this is what we're trying to understand. 
how do people think, reason, make decisions? And how do errors sneak in when they don't make adequate decisions? So this is the um, uh, things that we are really after. So what is cognitive informatics? So now when you have cognitive science that crosses biomedical informatics, it's called cognitive informatics. It's basically a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team, the field that comprises cognitive and information sciences, and has focus on how people think and reason the human cognition. Mechanisms and processes, how do people, they're not only interested in outcome, but the process that leads to an outcome, certain kinds of strategies that develop, and the design of any intervention solutions that you develop, and most often an engineering solution and information technology related. So basically you have science and engineering that can improve human activities. So you've got a, a field that includes engineering, in a scientific field of biomedical informatics and human thought. Okay, so that's what it's about. And that's basically I focus on my research has been for a number of years. So what is the major theorem that I want to propose today is that there is a shift from, there's a shift in thought from tools that try to be like humans. So you make, make decisions, make systems, intelligence systems that are like humans. So say so I've got this thing that can do it just like a human or, or something that can empower people to do better than what they do. Okay, so there's a shift in research and in, in the way of thinking from one end to the other. So today there are many systems that we develop. They understand the how human perceptual, how do we perceive and our cognitive skills that require to complete a task. If you want to complete a task, what kind of skills and how do you perceive information, how do you process it? And what we emphasize is systems that match and exceed human performance, can do better than humans. This system can do better than humans because it can do certain algorithms that can give you better results than humans can do. Or translating from scientific information to application so that to design people like computers that are intelligent and are autonomous. So you can, you, know, you don't need a human being to think about it. They're autonomous, so you're free, you're free to do what else you want to do and very human-like. However, we as users, or clinicians, or healthcare providers, want to be in control of our technologies. We don't want them to make our decisions for us that support their abilities. I want to do better at what I do but I want help. I can't remember everything. I can't remember things at the time when I want it and where I want it and in the form I want it. And I want to respect their responsibilities and empower me. I want to make certain kind of judgment call myself. I don't want technology to make that for me. So I want to augment my behavior rather than replace it. And that's a kind of shift in thought that I'm talking about currently. So this is the, the field of cognitive science that I trained in to medical cognition. This is about 1996 uh, oriented. I started my research, basically trained in the 80s. And 96, I started the really hardcore research in this area, mostly in the field of medical cognition. Not too many people were working in it. So cognitive science I trained in was knowledge organization, human memory, problem solving. How do people develop certain research strategies, develop heuristics? Uh, how do I perceive, I have attention? How do I understand any text that I read, write, see, I hear? A dialogue analysis. Um, how do I coordinate theory and evidence um, about my natural intelligence? And that can be in any field, doesn't have to be in medicine. But I have always been in the field of medicine. So I was interested in medical cognition. People always told me that it's going to be more difficult because medicine is a more complex domain. But challenge is always interesting and challenge is what science is all about. So 
how does this science relate to what we call in medicine? So when we talk about knowledge organization and human memory, I know how is knowledge organization organized in my brain, and how does my memory, so memory organized, and how how do I store short term, long term memory, and how they are related to each other, uh, and that has a relationship to medical cognition, organization of clinical science knowledge, the basic science knowledge. We talk about medical problem solving, decision making. We talk about perception. We talk about radiological and, and dermatological diagnosis. Uh, talking about text comprehension in children's literature to learning from medical text, um, you know, and so on, so forth. You can go up to natural intelligence in clinical practice. There is a thing called natural intelligence. You use your own um, mind to be able to understand it. Before we had too many technologies, we made our own decisions in medicine. We didn't have much support. However, it was now it's much more difficult to do because it's not so easy. The data is, we have massive amount of data to manage and we can't manage it without the support. So we need help, you see. So the next question is, um, let's go back, did I skip one? Um, so then we go on to the, that, that aspect that I just showed you moves on to the next one, which is the uh, developing of systems. So you develop systems based on medical cognition as to what are the systems you can do to support radiologic analysis, radiologic and dermatological analysis to the perceptual processing of patient data displays, for example, or natural intelligence with augmented intelligence. So one study, the series of studies that, um, that I did over a six year period that was supported by a granting agency in National Library of Medicine and um, part of it was supported, a large part was supported by James S. McDonald Foundation um, for six year studies with multi-site, uh, multidisciplinary studies that involved many universities. Uh, in the US. And the series of, and it's all about cognitive complexity and medical errors in critical care and, and ICU. But it was very generic. Now I'm going to describe some of this and tell you what we have learned from it, because that will tell you a little bit more about what kind of methods are available to tease out these cognitive processes so they can design better systems. And how we used to do things and how modern technologies and modern tools are available to us to help us um, collect data better so that we can use information more efficiently, effectively, and more importantly, safely, okay? And the so series of studies went from working with individual subjects, we worked with individual clinicians, doctors, uh, and, uh, to teams, to a team of people working together, such as a Grand Rounds, for example. And we did laboratory-based studies to in vivo and really working in the field itself as they're making decisions to evaluate clinical decision-making. We captured the process of decision-making via audio recording as well as observers observing them. These are very early studies. And we looked at generation and correction of errors and classified them very carefully with respect to taxonomy as well as expert team. So let me walk you through this. So laboratory-based studies to the, the studies in the wild. So we had control experiments on one side with individuals one by one, and we had naturalistic and teams. We had paper-based scenarios, simulation, what we call in vitro, we gave people tasks to do in a paper-based real clinical scenarios. They worked through them for us. We recorded them, we analyzed them. And here, audio recording of observations. We shadowed doctors, physicians in the clinics and got all the detailed information. So various methods were used, multi, 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 multiple disciplines and multiple methods were used to capture this and use natural language analysis to analyze those. So specific methods are in your shadow, uh, people 
and doctors and nurses at the critical times in the phases where they're working in a pertinent period behind. Unobtrusively, they, after a while, don't know even you're there, but you have to be trained to do that. You can be obtrusive. You've got to blend in. A mapping of activities of where layout in the ICU or ER in this case, and timestamp every activity and each interaction and event. Who's moving where? When are they moving? We kept, we kept tab on everything. Everything was done very, very hand, hand done. We didn't have any automatic method at that time doing it. So it was labor intensive conducting brief interviews to gain insights on infrastructure, role shifting, to find out what people do, what are their tasks, etc. And then finally obtaining log files. Nowadays, moment you, you, moment you click on a, on a computer in the hospital or any clinics anywhere, anywhere, you leave a digital imprint, digital footprint, which means they're obtaining the log files of this clinical information system and correlate with observation data to see what people are doing in the electronic health record system, another system, what exactly are they doing, where are they doing, and how long are they doing it for. And these are very interesting from every perspective and you can use all these multiple forms of data. You don't need to use everything. You use what you need depending on the kinds of questions you're asking. The more important one is think aloud. How do you get at what people are doing deep down? So you want to get at their thought processes. So you get them a task to do and you put a microphone on their lapel. Here we got a microphone, it's a kind of old, old fashioned one, but you, you just put them in a tiny one on a lapel and they would just, um, uh, just go around doing the task and they'll just talk saying that, okay, I'm doing this now. And they'll think aloud and you capture it. And the, the trick is in analyzing that data in a protocol analysis is called and trying to uh, use theories and methods to, to um, analyze it, to come up with what the processes they are using in making decisions. So this is the one that goes from, so now you've got medical cognition on one side organization of basic sciences, the, the whole thing that I described before. On the right-hand side, we want to use this information that we collected now to use the biomedical informatics aspect, which is development use of databases, medical artificial intelligence, decision support system, medical imaging system, human computer interaction, uh, and so on, the biomedical information visualization, augmented intelligence. So we want to now move to understanding how people think and reason in a clinical world to exactly how do we build systems that we can support these people who are thinking a particular way or doing or making mistakes that we can support to help them reduce them. So here is a progressive study. So these are more recent studies starting from 2007. All of these studies are published every one of them, uh, because we had multiple sites and multiple people, very competent people working in a team. Um, so they were controlled individuals on the paper-based simulation that I described. And then we had the naturalistic environment, which I also described. And we moved on to the digital part. We moved on to the comp computational augmentation, we call it. The sensor-based technology, contextual computing. So now, we're doing similar things, but we are leveraging the technology currently available to us to be able to analyze data, able to collect the data and interpret it. That I didn't say it was going to be easy, but we tried to do that over the period of time. We continue to do that. And that is the whole idea is to support humans, what you're doing in the naturalistic task. Naturalistic task is where it is complex task. When you're talking about simple things, individuals do, when you don't capture the details, it really is very simple and it is linear. Here, complex task is not linear. It's non-linear people do in, in haphazard manner. And it's not, and most systems today are developed or have been developed to support 
that is a linear way of people work through them, but they don't work that way. So let me walk through the next one. So this is one such study, contextual computing, a Bluetooth-based approach for tracking healthcare providers in emergency room. This is one of my master's students, uh, Josh Frisby, worked in emergency room and wanted to know how can we shorten um, door, to, door to doctor time, which means how can we shorten the time from the time patient arrives in the emergency to the first seen by the doctor, okay? How can we shorten that time? Because right now it takes a long time and it's a bottleneck in the emergency room. So we are trying to do very fast. And so he used Bluetooth beacon technology that, that is, is used by physicians that they, it's, it's, it's actually uh, put on on the wall and, and the doctors carry little tags and they look at the movement, mostly captures the movement and timestamp. So you can say exactly how long did it take for them to move from one place to another and what and then we can find out where are the bottlenecks where they're spending more time less time. We don't know why are they spending less time or more time because this kind of study doesn't tell you that but it tells you the movement of it and where the big blocks are. So technology has really advanced the, and here we have a big tag that when I started in 2007, this is how big tags doctors used to carry around them. And you can imagine when we worked in psychiatry, our patients freaked out because they kept saying, now why are you doing that to me? You know, uh, this is not something that people like to see. Somebody's being recorded, they don't want to see that in front of them. Nowadays, these kinds of tags are pocket tags, tiny flip things, tiny, tiny ones. And these are tiny little sensor. Before you used to have a huge sensor base we used to take in the middle of the room. Now we just sent, it sits on the wall. And this is an example of where it sits. It sits on the wall here. This is the emergency room, the Mount Sinai in New York. And it captures all that area, certain area it captures. So that all the physicians have this little tag. And nowadays what we do is we have a wall full of these tags and you cannot, so you walk in, pull out a tag, put it in your pocket, and you sign, you sign, it signs on. You cannot sign on to the computer, your electronic record system, without taking one of these tags. And it has a long battery life. When we used to do it by physically, uh, graduate students and I used to go at midnight and change the batteries and change the provider who is to carry this. So now we have graduated with this. So this is a kind of a diagram of how what it shows you where people are moving and the thickness of the line tells you how much they are moving. These are all people around there and thickness tells you how long, how, how many times they're moving. But we don't know why they're moving, okay? Just the movement we can carry, where they're going completely. So the real data to show is this is a physician tracking data, real data, at time one, and this is at time two. As you can see, people have moved, and these are individual providers. As you can see, the whole different providers come into picture at time two. So what, why is this happening? Why are they moving from back and forth? It's, it's, the, it's the main nature, so you can, so we record at the same time. We record everything while we're doing the study to find out not only the movement, but why are they moving? I am moving closer to my, my colleague, but why am I moving closer? Or just to socially chit chat? Or am I really moving there to do a particular reason? So the audio recording tells you that. But the trick again is to map them all. So as we did collected all this study a period of time, one of the things we found is number of top places where errors occurred. It's just want to focus for time being, I want to move away from the sensor digital technology to talk about nature of the errors that occur in the real world. We found that when we tested individually, there were a lot more errors generated. But when we talked in a group, there are much, there are fewer errors. So how does, when you work in the real field, the real in practice, we found that 
So a clinician comes in and does a routine normal practice, comes in, sees the patient, and is, as a decision support, use it. Then there is a boundary, what we call boundary of safe practice, which is a clinical guideline, which you should not pass because the clinical guideline tells you something as a boundary. And some, if you pass the boundary, you almost miss, you missed, and you almost near miss an error. And you didn't make an error, but you near, nearly did. And then if you cross the second boundary of safe practice, you have an adverse event and that causes death. Okay, there are two safety boundaries. One is you almost missed it. You know, I almost didn't see that patient should not have been on oxygen, but I'm glad I caught it. Um, but you can miss it and it's an adverse event, okay? So these are kinds of studies that are natural environment that we did and came up with this model. This is the violations of the safe bounds of safe practices. And this is the detection and correction of violation. What it really says is that error recovery, if you recover from near miss, is a part of a normal clinical activity. No use saying you shouldn't make an error because you should reduce the error for sure, but errors will happen. So if it happens, what do you do about it? You train people not to not to make it many mistakes i'm using double negative but to train them how to recover from them quickly once you do make a mistake what is the process of error recovery you know i nearly missed it but i was able to catch it how was i able to catch it what was the process by which i caught it so that we can make this implicit thing much more explicit and make it more transparent rather than an opaque black box, so that we can teach the decision support system. That's the key to it. So error recovery is very important in this theme. And this model came from our real studies of the environment. So this is the role of this. We published this in Human Error Detection and Correction in, in uh, uh, BMJ, British Medical Journal, on, and on role of cognition in generating and mitigating clinical errors. and. Um, the, so the error and error recovery, we found that experts, when people are good at doing what they do in clinician, in their own domain of expertise. So if I happen to be an ER expert and I'm working on the emergency room, then to detect that they, they make many errors because it's not, we always believed, I was always meant to believe that if you are good at something, you're really expert, you don't make mistakes, as many mistakes. It's only people who are new, people who, who are the ones who make mistakes. But we didn't find that. We found that people who are experts do make mistakes. Maybe not as many as the ones who are novices, but they do make mistakes, quite a few of them. But they detect it and recover from them very quickly. It's so fast, they quickly realize they made a mistake and say, backtrack and, and recover from them before the damage occurs. This is what novices or trainees are not able to do. So training in this particular part of development of expertise is how you develop expertise, which is very important. Not many, nobody actually focuses on that on training. So the question of zero or error tolerance policy, it questions it really because uh, you, do, you do want to do everything to reduce error, but Complexity actually helps us to maintain certain kinds of, of activities that we save lives because we, we do better in that environment because you do multitasking in some environment, you do need to do multitasking. But if errors occur, how can you quickly recover from it? So all these studies are published in one book, uh, Cognitive Informatics and Health and Biomedicine, that I um, Edit in in uh, it, this particular group is paper is case studies in clinical critical care complexity and errors and was edited with myself and David Kaufman and Trevor Cohen 
they were both my graduate students once, but now they are, of course, uh, highly professional uh, academics. And this was published in 2014, all the studies. However, so these studies are also all individually in journals and everywhere else. So they are all available, we can look them up. So decision, um, support system in complex environment. This, so I'm going to touch a little bit more, a little bit about decision support system since I already talked about it a little bit in the errors. So decision support systems such as electronic health record system, I consider them electronic health as decision support because they do support our decisions. Designed to support clinicians in a complex environment uh, are linear, so very linear. So if there is a EHR, they're put in currently in our hospitals uh, and they are, they go in a straight line. So they, they design like you train a, a, a hospital, a, a trainee, a medical student to say, look, work up a system for a patient, walk through the work up of the interviews and then you go through the physical exam, then you go, it's a very linear form. And therefore, this is how the systems are designed to, to walk through so that their physicians are working in a linear form. And actually it diminish, diminishes its utility, it could have a better utility. But the workflow, the clinical workflow in the complex environment, we show in all our studies are non-linear. People go back and forth all the time, completely from, medi they start with medication, and then they will go in between saying, okay, now let's look at the patient problem. Let's go back to what medication he or she was on. Go back and forth. And systems are not designed to support that. There are opportunities here to calibrate the user interface design, to align better with clinical workflow, with clinicians' model of decision-making. So once we can understand what clinicians do and better design, let me give you a concrete example. My colleague Kai, uh, Kai Zhang from UGSF, uh, he um, did this study which is designed to support in those providers' clinical activities. So this is a uh, part of a left-hand side, is a part of a electronic health record system walked through by a physician using a system, a EHR, EHR use is designed by a, a current vendor. And you found that this is how it's supposed to support, right in a linear way, okay? When we did all the studies, when we found out all the multiple physicians and clinicians who were using this, we found all this different data. This is position one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Nobody went in a linear fashion. They're all in a complex environment, they go sort of non-linear. In other words, one part does not make a whole, it's a non-linear fashion. So clinicians' day-to-day -day practice deviate from the recommended best practices that um, people, uh, we, we do it through the design of the system currently available. And therefore, the the system is used in an unintended way, not the way it should be used. And if they can use it better, uh, you will get a better utility out of it. Therefore, evaluating real uses of technology in the natural context is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. No, no vendors don't do that these days. Okay, to re the review of the key issues in, in AI and medicine. So we addressed why these were such an important thing in an article coming of age of artificial intelligence in medicine in 2009. And we had multiple authors, myself, with Ted Shortliff and Mario Stefanelli from, and, and Peter Solvitz. And, and all these people are from different countries, except some Ted and I are both from Edward Shortliff and myself, they're both from US, but the rest are from Italy and Netherlands and variety of other places uh, that, and Germany, to give a multiple perspective on it, to say where are the current thing. It's a very important paper that gives you where we are currently with developing intelligent systems. And although it's a little out of date, 2009, but fundamental is there. So 
this is the um, current book that we are working on uh, right now that we published in 2020. And the editors are myself and Trevor Cohen, uh, myself and Ted Shortliff. And this is in preparation now and should be ready hopefully soon. And this kind of uses basically the, the idea is intelligence system in medicine and health and the role of AI. And this is the current status of why cognitive, cognitive informatics is so important in developing these kinds of intelligence systems that augment our behavior. So in view to summarize everything, in the interest of time, the points I wanted to make clear that you understand at the end of it, because I said many things. If you can go away with a few of these points, that would be great. The science of cognition or science is needed to drive intelligent decision support system. So you need to know how humans do things before you can develop intelligent systems that help to augment our behavior, to make our behavior better. And if you keep using just machine learning, which has many data points, you will never capture the hidden variables that defy adequate consideration. There are a lot of hidden variables, but never apology. Decision, these millions of data that you capture by the data science and machine learning, they are important but they're not going to get at points where you want to augment the behavior. Suitably in introduced intelligence system unite the strengths of people and machines when optimizing value from data, okay? If you get, want to get most out of data, you've got to have suitably introduced. Other important thing is we get a lot of biases in these systems, the imbalanced data sources, right? All the data, this the consumers are not captured. People of different ethnicity, uh, different backgrounds are not captured in there. They reinforce and strengthen the biases of people who use them. These systems are pretty dangerous. So they, they, they reinforce and strengthen any biases that exist if those are not done properly in the first place. We need to develop and continue collaborative efforts. You can't do it alone. You really can't collaborative effort between these system developers, researchers, with both cognitive and social, because mind is one thing, but social cognitive is very important in the social environment. We are social creatures. You know, our habits, our environment, our the environment, the social cognitive environment, um, and our practices, they all affect us, and clinical communities. The clinical communities, if you don't work with them, you're not going to address the real people, thereby developing something that is use, usable because you want to have the good usability and the useful human support by augmenting human intelligence. We are intelligent people, but we want help. So we want to augment our intelligence for better and safe delivery of healthcare. So basically these are the ones we do. And if we do that, understand the human, understand the real natural environment before you start developing this. All my students in computer science want to develop an app, but they have never been in the area for which the app was going to be used. So it's very important that we introduce that, understand that sociocognitive environment. With that, I want to say thank you, and thank you for listening to me, and I really greatly appreciate it. I'm going to... Sharing slide. Thanks, uh, Bemla. That was great. We have um, some questions that have queued up in the chat, and I think some of them are still on. So, um, Paul Cooper, would you like to address your uh, question from the chat to Vimla? Or Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much, Vimla. That was really, really fascinating and uh, really wonderful to see your work there. Um, my question was really uh, just uh, I was considering the, the role of expert systems, and I've been sort of tracking this field uh, over, you know, several decades. And I guess one of the issues that uh, Dreyfus and Dreyfus uh, sort of raised a number of years ago was how do you capture the expertise that has become deeply unconscious? 
And uh, one of the things that they found was that uh, when they asked people, why did you just uh, make that decision or what is it you're currently doing? Essentially, they just made stuff up. They didn't deliberately set out to mislead, but they were just, their brain was trying to verbalize something that was actually unconscious. Yes. And um, so I'm wondering with your uh, thinking aloud capture, what, what has been your finding? Have you, have you found that that has been a, a good way to actually capture uh, some of this uh, expertise thinking or are you finding the same sort of um, limitation? All right, uh, good question. Well, of course, I'm familiar with your work as well. Uh, and um, the drivers and drivers, of course, been around for many years, but started with the expertise area when I was working on expertise area and subsequently went into more technology related. So it's, it's the, 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 the interesting part is, is really the depth in the, in the analysis. So when you ask people, what are you thinking or what are you doing? they will tell you, if you ask me um, uh, what I am currently doing, I'll describe it to you, okay? You capture that. What I'm describing to you is what I think I'm doing, okay? This may not be what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but I have already reconstructed in my memory what I'm doing the way yes. I want, okay? And basically what I'm doing is explaining to you a very different thing. Now, if you get people to um, just talk aloud what they're doing. If I'm doing a task, if you give me a task and say, um, don't tell me what you're doing, just talk aloud as you're doing it. Now that's different. Ah. That's really capturing the real process. That's an up unconscious and conscious effort, both. So there, that's where the detail is. Now, the trick is an analysis. Once you have got it, it's a kind of symbolic representation of the natural language that you have to do the detailed analysis on to be able to say what kind of process, what are the, the it's kind of, um, what are the nations, what are the knowledge bases here that I'm using? Okay, exactly. What are the strategies I'm using to bring out this knowledge and how I'm linking one thought process to another one or is it this, and coherent? Are they coherent processes? Are they, am I thinking in a coherent way? So for example, if a resident or somebody is asked to do that exactly what you asked me to do, and if you see suddenly they're not in a coherent, they're not thinking coherent, making an inaccurate decision, you know there's trouble. So you can look for this coherence, but they are capture unconscious and conscious part of it. Uh, slightly different. So this is a very common error made that when you ask people to explain, is somewhat different. And, and you have to train people to think aloud. We train uh, physicians to say, look, I want you to give you a task and say, think aloud about it first. And they sometimes they describe to you, no, I don't want you to describe, just talk. I'm saying, I, I can't really do that. I don't know why I did that. Now why I did that, I want to go back now, but I can't go back, the system won't let me. So that's kind of stuff. You're thinking oh. aloud what you're doing. So I hope it helps this thing. Yeah, okay. thank you. That, that's really illuminating. Thank you. Okay, our, our next question is from Daniel Kapurl, who's sitting right next to me. Hi, Vimla. Uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about your experience in navigating sort of like these two disconnected worlds that you, you mentioned. Uh, on one side, we have all the academic work that, that we do uh, on trying to understand how how clinicians think and work and operate and how to improve that. But on the other hand, we have, you know, software developers and vendors and st tech startups that have, you know, they move at a different speed. And, you know, so how do we navigate these two sort of colliding worlds and collaborate and make things actually make it into the real world of, of, of you know, software and products that clinicians end up actually using? It is, it is always difficult, that is, um, you know, because most of these software people, people most often even work in vendors, um, they want to produce, get the first generation thing out as early as possible and just develop, because the interesting is developing this engineering tool, that's the task, you know. And um, they want to develop and they sometimes, so when we collaborate, one thing is when, when I try to understand what 
doctors or clinicians do in, in the practice. Um, and then trying to develop a system, trying to get vendors interested or the engineers interested. They're usually saying, well, I want to develop an app, but I'm not so sure I want to, this is going to slow me down tremendously if I start to do what you're doing, because I need to move fast with it. I'll never get it done. Now, I find the best way to get them to collaborate is I've had a number of grants that uh, that kind of put these people, the system developer engineers together with the clinicians and the one team. So you have a clinician expert who works with the engineering expert to together. And there's one way to do that so that because they're part of my team, I'm not studying the clinician. The clinician is part of my study. So he's the champion or she's the champion and she leads it. And same for the engineer, say we're going to develop a tool. I found this thing that this is how doctors uh, go through, uh, develop, use patient data to be able to come up with a pyramid, to manage data, to be able to come up with a diagnosis. And I think we can use these ideas in engineering system, but so we got to get an engineering person who's interested in doing this research to work together. Uh, and then once you've got it, you can use them as a leverage to get other engineers interested. That's one way I have found it much better to work with. But I have to be in the field. You know, wouldn't you like to develop a better system that can help you? Yes, I hate this system, this is clunky. So you get, so you get the engineer interested and you bring them together on the same table face to face. Second way to do it, which we've been doing now, is I teach a course in human factors and human engineering. And majority of my students are from engineering school and computer, but they want all work in healthcare. So, and of course, a number of them are biomedical informatics. My first task is find out what are you interested in, what you want to do. Of course, everybody wants to develop an app engineers. First thing I do is take them all into the hospital. Okay, and then I have champion hospital champion at emergency in public health in various aspects of the hospital. We take them on the tour and we show them this is what they do and this is what happens. And we give them all kinds of simulation to show them this is what really happens. Now that you want to develop an app, now you think about it. So when they are working a student, to start early, early in the process, get graduate students started early as possible, to say, let's develop something that you can present at a healthcare meeting as an informatics meeting, at AMIA meeting, that engineers develop. We need engineering because without that, we can't do it, but you need to work them together. You know, otherwise you, you, you kind of, they keep on working. But one thing you have to understand, those, that, that champion clinician engineer, champion clinician is gonna help us recruit the others. And students starting early developing these are going to be really helpful. All my students who graduated from this, a uh, number of them, of course, majority of them do at the master's level in engineering school, and they all have been working in, in industry, and they're finding this extremely useful uh, to bring people together. And I found a number of people who have been very interested in collaborating more with academia. Uh, we're going to see more and more of this now, of, of in people, vendors interested in working with academia because cognition and cognitive informatics is going to be a big time thing. And secondly, we are going to worry about patient safety. We really are going to worry about it. And, and, and more and more and more and more we're doing this. I think the natural, national science of medicine, engineering, and, and uh, uh, the uh, other national academies are going to be particularly coming up with reports soon that's going to require more in that. So I think cajoling them, bringing them together, starting with one that would be really a champion, usually I have found it personally very helpful. Uh, Venla, can I just uh, ask a follow-up question to that? One of the things that I've seen over the uh, decades is as hospitals get more crowded, informatics programs get pushed farther and farther away. And so there's less, um, uh, opportunities and um, I, when I was doing my PhD, I lived in radiology and you know observed it. Um, it was hard for us to get the hospitals to view um, the informatics or engineering students as integral to the system. They weren't outsiders; they should be there 
just like medical students or nursing students should be there. Um, did, have you run across similar kind of barriers? And if so, you know, how did you navigate that? Yes, this is a barrier that everybody crosses. Um, something I had learned very early when I had to do the think aloud protocols very early, I'd learned then how to deal with this. And um, luckily I started at Columbia University with being part of the hospital system as on the adverse committee, error committee, adverse event committee. So I had inside help to a little bit maneuver to how to deal with this thing. Yes, this is a problem, even using sensor-based technology get to be able to use it to use uh, radio frequency identifiers to put on the walls tracking people it's really troublesome people don't buy it as easily um, so the best way we have dealt with once again is a physician in that area who's willing to work with you as a collaborator who's paid part of the time with them and using through them and then you blend in the environment we all have white coats like they do we all have name badges with clearly who we are. And then you blend in the system as much as possible. You walk around, you understand them, go to their meetings. They have, you know, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, go to their meetings, get to use them. And then through that, you get to the administration where you say, look, we need to do this study and we're going to up apply for a hospital grant that to get the hospital the clinicians to help you apply for this hospital grant to be able to um, uh, move the study forward now you can put it under an umbrella of uh, hospitals have an umbrella so what they call educational advancement or patient safety or some kind of things like that and you put it under that umbrella don't say i'm doing a research in this area they'll never buy it so you quickly go through that and put it in an umbrella so that IRB passes, you know, through that system. That clinician leads it for you. You have to step back, step a bit. And that way we find we'll be able to get through many things. Sometimes I haven't been able to get a hospital to do it. I've just changed the hospital, you know, one hospital to another. Um, and that cost me a year of study, but I was able to do it. Now, um, Mayo Clinic was willing to work with me in Mount Sinai, Columbia, New York Presbyterian, but um, you know, the number of other hospitals were difficult even. So it's really going inside, blending in, getting the physicians to work with it. And then now a concrete example of that, uh, in Columbia, we had a adverse event, uh, a patient who um, a serious event of kidney failure uh, because it was overdose of potassium. Uh, and I was called in to an investigate what had happened exactly. Uh, so I came in and I took my postdoc with me and we went in to investigate. And I knew we could do this study, but I had made it clear that if we, my postdoc is going to spend that much time, I'm going to spend time. I want to get work published. The hospital administration, the lawyer said no. We can't say we make that kind of mistake. Uh, I said, well, look, you, you can pretend mistakes don't happen in hospitals, or you can put it under the education umbrella and say, look, you're trying to identify what mistakes happen, and we're gonna try to put up a training program. So I was able to put that through hospital, through an education program, and they had to run a training based on it. The paper was, paper was published in Jania, and uh, the mistakes that were made, by whom, how many residents made a mistake, a nurse and a pharmacy, and how did it happen, and how we're training them now, and the training program is in place. So when, they, when the, uh, the uh, accreditation committee came around, they said, look, mistakes happen, but we are selecting our mistakes. We're doing something about it. And then they also told the vendors, change this thing or else, you know, we don't want you. So they changed a few things, not to our satisfaction, but they did it. So there are ways, means to go around, uh, but always have to blend in. We didn't stand out in any way. We kind of quietly hung around the background and we kind of blended in and got to know the people. So we are part of the social, the cultural environment. And I remember going from medicine to surgery, I was kind of like a sore thumb. And a surgery, surgical, surgical people are very different from medicine. So they tell me, we don't do things that way here. So I had to suddenly just 
do a surgeons to kind of be very blunt with everything, kind of work around them. So you have to learn to be a part of a system and put it through systems that are already recognized. I found that useful. All right, well, thanks. There's one last question. And unfortunately, it uh, looks like Stella signed off. If, if you're still on Stella, I feel uh, free to pipe in. But her question is, uh, what's the role of uh, simulation and simulating environments to understand the decision-making uh, process and the impact of uh, these human behaviors? There, there are various kinds of simulations, of course. You know, we, we do... Um, virtual reality kind of thing as well you know this, the book i described to you the the critical care and icu there we were made from individuals to um uh, team decision making to um uh, digital uh, trying to get people uh, where they are going and what they are doing digitally and then we moved on to simulation actually virtual reality created what icu looked like into virtual reality and we gave all the residents in the simulation program uh, act doing medical program medical questions and try to work towards it that simulation is very important to see uh, trying to understand what they do that could be helpful in later on in training program that's one. Second, simulation is very important for training purposes. You can do that for training, uh, capturing data that are simulated in a way that you can do, to capture as real, real situation as possible. Because you're not always possible to work in the real environment. They won't let you, you know, as, as you just pointed out very rightly so. They won't let you just go around recording. But if you can simulate that in some way and create it and and that can simulate could create a digital simulation and then you can walk through with the um your trainee yourself to see what people do and and try to understand that and that will be very helpful for the graduate students to be able to do i find it very useful in many many ways we did in mayo clinic the similar set of proposal of simulations in uh, one of the areas I can't remember now, but they all publish data and uh, I have them all. And if you need them, let me know. Uh, but simulations are extremely valuable. Even now with the COVID-19, uh, we found it that I think we advocate a recent paper that Ted and I published um, in um, uh, BMJ again, I think. Uh, yes, in BMJ Health and Healthcare Informatics uh, that um, sim simulations are so important in capturing this because you can't go into the COVID related environment to capture what you need to capture what they're doing because we need that. But simulations of these things are very important for training. Can I sneak in one last question? And it's, it's, it's based on what something Paul uh, Cooper had in the, um, in the chat. And that's the, the role of mistakes. What, the kind of the root of my question comes from uh, Sherry Turkle in her book, A Recovering Conversation. I've thought about this from education where one of the roles of the uh, like the teacher is modeling recovering from mistakes and i've i've wondered there's a problem there with perfected pre-recorded lectures that are delivered where everything goes through exactly as planned um how, how what is kind of the pedagogical opportunities for um uh, making mistakes and modeling re re recovering from them in a way that's not um labeled as um, yeah a, ne a negative sense of the, this mistake having occurred in you know whatever setting you mean um uh, sort of in 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 teaching people well in, in in kind of either setting you have this role of the the experts uh recover from mistakes uh much more quickly um how do you teach that yeah how do you teach that i mean do, Yes. Do, do they yes. speak out loud? Oh, I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, look at this, how I'm, I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, you know, one thing I didn't say, the limitations of our studies, that, you know, we don't have oodles of data in it, you know, that it tells you enough, enough information to tell you that these are issues that we deal with. You can, if you can capture many scenarios like that, and that kind of thing will tell you how people recover. Now, so if you say, how do a trainee becomes an expert? 
what are the knowledge and strategies that develop as they become an expert in a domain? How a radiologist who is a trainee radiologist becomes an expert radiologist. And if you can follow the pattern of what they do, then you also, one part would be a certain point in time, you will see suddenly that their pattern of doing things will change, that they say, um, okay, um, I think that I, I, I see that it's a shadow on the left-hand side. No, just a moment, I don't think shadow on the left hand. I don't think that's a shadow. I quickly will say, they say that as they're going along. You see suddenly they're developing these kinds of patterns. Now, I am the, I'm not exactly uh, clear on how exactly, to, how to go about training in this, but I'd be definitely one thing is sure, we need more data in that points, data points. And this, this particular question is important, but I haven't given enough thought to, but I, now that you've raised it, I will give some thought to, and I'll come back to you on that one.